So now it's time to complete some more of our reading group books. So this is my pocket full of stars group. We are going to carry on from where we were up to. Um, it's been a fantastic book so far. Aisha Bushby. Bushby is it? I really love what you've done with this book. You've really chosen strong, powerful, important themes for children. Parents separating, you know, parents becoming ill, you know, parents from different cultures and he really brought it to life. We also really enjoyed in the last chapter the way the main character, um, Saf, she is maturing at a different rate to her friends and she's feeling left out and that really was brilliant. My group really picked that up. I just remembered I'm not actually talking to the author, I'm talking to the children, I'm talking to you my dears. So I'm going to start reading but yeah, Aisha, Aisha Bushby, we love your book. I hope you don't think I'm infringing copyright. I'm just making sure my group can carry on reading. So we are up to crew. Bear with, bear with. Chapter nine, page 57. And we're gonna read through this, chapter 10 and 11. We've got quite a lot to get through. So you might want to do this over a couple of days this week, guys. I'll do it all in one go. It's up for you. We'll then pick up some more chapters next week. Chapter nine. It takes a lot of convincing before Dad lets me go up to Mum's hospital room by myself again, especially after Amanda let slip that I cried the first time. I wanted to be alone so I could dream about the house, but I feel stupid now. I've been here for five minutes already and nothing has happened. Maybe, maybe it was a coincidence, after all. But as soon as I go to stand up, the shiny hospital floor is replaced by sandy concrete slabs. And when I look up, I see a bright yellow sun in the sky instead of artificial lights on a grey ceiling. As the house materialises in front of me for the third time, I know in my heart that something magical is happening. I rush inside, across the foyer, to the gold-lined glass top table and I see it again. The bracelet, just like before, it glows slightly brighter than ever everything else and I'm reminded of the crystals we have to collect in Fairy Hunters which have gold halos around them, letting us know they're items we can collect. I pick the bracelet up, clasp it firmly in my hands and wait. The same laughter, the same blur of hair, but I follow them this time, the two girls. The house is awake today. I can feel its heartbeat pounding. The smells are more vivid with the bracelet in my hand. The colours brighter. I'll open the curtains on a sunny day. Hello? I call, out of breath, as I chase the girls up the stairs, crossing parts of the house I've never seen before. There are photo frames with pictures that I know hold stories, and doors that lead to rooms I'd love to see. But I don't have time to explore. Not now. The girls ignore me, intent on chasing one another. Hello? Where am I? I try again. They stop suddenly in front of a set of lavish forest green double doors. But I built up too much momentum and I braced myself just as I'm about to crash right into them. I close my eyes and hold my hands out. Instead of clothes and hair, I feel wood and brass. It's as if I've walked right through the girls and straight into the door. Then all of a sudden, the doors swing open with force. I jump out of the way just as a woman appears. She has orange hair like fire and a beautiful face that looks like... Mum? But she looks different here. That's when I picture the photo by Mum's bed and my eyes widen in realisation. What on earth is going on? My grandmother demands. I, uh, it, it wasn't... I stutter, but the strangest thing happens. She walks straight past me. Straight through me. So I think what we predicted here, gang, you know, some of you were saying that she's almost travelling back in time, but she's on looking, she's not in the action, is really, really accurate. She can't see me. I test out my theory and wave my hands in front of her face. I even try to touch her arm, but my hand goes through her. None of them can see me. They always say if you cross a ghost, you feel a shiver down your spine. That's not what this is like, because I feel nothing, not even a breeze. Maybe because I'm the ghost. Amina, are you tormenting your sister again? My grandmother asks, her voice like poison. We have guests and they can hear you from all the way out here. 
I frown. Amina. I'm not, Mama, I swear. The older girl calls from the landing. And that's when I confirm it. The wild curly hair. That's Mum. And the younger girl must be her sister. Mama, she hit me. The younger girl, my aunt Zaina, posts, pouts, showing off her sore arm. Mum, or I guess Amina, rolls her eyes. Zaina stole my bracelet, she says, both of them speaking a mixture of English and Arabic. I look at the bracelet in my hands. It's gold with white pearl beads and an Arabic inscription. Amina. So there's Amina in Arabic. Remembering that this is, we've journeyed back to Kuwait, where Saf's mum, Amina, grew up. It's here, I say, waving it in front of their faces. But there's no point. I'm invisible to them all. And why would, and why would she do that, my grandmother? Mama asks her voice as sharp as her features. It has your name on it. Why don't you ask her, Amina replies. And I can't help but smile because she's just like the mum I know. I didn't steal it, Mama, Zayna insists. She lost it. Mama turns to Zayna now. Go inside and ask your aunt if she wants more tea, she orders. Zayna nods right away. And close the door behind you. Mama turns to Amina. Where are you going? In the time it took for Mama to address Zayna, Amina had tried to sneak off downstairs. She spins round now like a clumsy ballerina and faces Mama. Are you a child? Mama asks. Amina shakes her head. How old are you? Thirteen, she mutters. Like me. Then, Mama pauses, you know it's wrong to hit your sister. But Mama, Zayna was the one who... Mama puts her hand up to silence Amina, and her voice stop, stops dead. Zayna is younger than you, Amina. You can't use her as an excuse. Sorry. Amina sniffs, and I see tears in her eyes. And you lost your bracelet? Amina doesn't argue back this time. I won't buy you nice things anymore if you can't look after them. Oh, lost me. Mama... Mama's not yelling, but she doesn't need to. I wonder what that means. Think about what that means. Why doesn't Mama need to yell? I picked it up. Sorry, Mama. Amina squeaks again, eyes trained on her feet. I don't recognise this side of Mum. She looks scared and mouse-like. You're back from school for one day. One day! Mama says, her voice echoing across the hall, despite her tiny frame. And already you cause trouble. I wish sometimes your father would take you travelling with him over the summer. Then I wouldn't have to deal with all of this. She sighs exasperatedly. That's great language there. You know, when you're beyond exhausted, exasperatedly. It's an offhand remark, kind of like the ones mum makes sometimes. But I can almost feel the burn of it on Amina's heart. Amina's tears fall freely now. She runs down the stairs out of the house and into the scorching heat of the courtyard. I follow her barely keeping up. I want to give her the bracelet and tell her she hasn't lost it after all. Outside, Amina sits on the set of swings I saw last time and lets herself cry. I try to pat her shoulder to comfort her, but my hand goes right through her. I think for a moment about the rules in this dream, in the same way I would approach, approach one of my games. I can't touch anyone and they can't see me, but I can pick things up like the bracelet and brush my hands against the leaves on the walls. I sit on the swing next to Amina, and it jiggles around, but she doesn't appear to see that either. Amina rocks gently to and fro, letting her feet graze the ground until her tears dry up and she falls silent. But the sound of someone singing cuts through the quiet. Hello? Amina calls, looking around her. Silence. Then, ow! Something lands hard on Amina's shoulder. She whips her head up to the right, searching for the source. She doesn't spot it, but I, too, I do, just about. Two cats rush under the shel shelter of one of the cars. They had come from somewhere beyond the courtyard wall and had used Amina as a landing pad. 
From down here, all you can see are palm trees beyond a great big wall. They hold more of the silver branches that line the house. The singing has stopped now and is replaced by the light padding of feet on sand. Hello? Amina tries again. She pulls an old slide up against the wall, climbs to the top and peeks her head over. I do the same, leaning through her body to look over too. For a moment, it's like we're the same person. Over the wall is a long hidden alleyway filled with all sorts of overgrown trees which create a tunnel-like arch across it. Each end is blocked by concrete, concealing it from the outside world. Amina and I spot a short-haired girl just as she starts climbing the wall into the courtyard of one of the other houses. Amina starts to call for the girl, but she but her own name echoes from somewhere behind us. We turn at the same time. Zina struts up to the slide. You got in trouble, she teases, Amina's bracelet dangling from her wrist. I look down at my right hand, but the bracelet is gone. Amina sighs and looks back, but the girl has disappeared. And in that moment, everything else disappears too. The house, the courtyard, Amina and her sister. And suddenly, instead of the slide, I'm sitting on the hospital chair next to Mum's bed. Her hair is curly and as wild as it was when she was 13. Right, I'm going to stop this and move on to the next chapter, but we'll discuss that chapter at the start of the next video.